what was ruined because it became popular. Without a doubt the entire concept of food trucks. Food trucks used to be quick cheap eats that were pretty good despite coming from a cart or the back of a truck. The hipsters and suburban folk got involved, and now I'm eating food that while good, is now 12 to 15 bucks for small serving of Korean barbecue or weird Brazilian fusion in panadas. If I want to drink it's another 2. 50. The whole point of a food truck is, that it's fast cheap and somewhat good. Now it's just expensive bullcrap, that I have to eat standing up. Keep calm and carry on. Short version. Posters created during we in case of Nazi invasion of Britain. Never used, except maybe in the Channel Islands. Copy discovered in a bookshop in the mid 2000s. Finders keepers applied, everyone starts printing keep calm man. On literally fucking everything. The simplicity of the original message lost forever in thousands of items of utter fucking tat. That one bar in your neighborhood, that used to be really great, because you could just go there, and have a nice drink at a reasonable price, maybe even take a date there, if you were so inclined, because you were on first name terms with the bartender as he didn't have enough customers, that he couldn't be on first name terms with everyone, but they didn't know that, and you could just play it off as you being cool and popular, but then it got a couple of good reviews and now every fucker and his dog is there on a Friday night. So the place is rampacked, and it takes you a good 20-30 minutes to get your cocktail on and now, rather than being a regular you're just one more face in a sea of people who are just looking to get hammered, so your only options are either to go out on a Tuesday night, because that's the only time it's remotely close to being quiet, or leave and find a new bar, only to have the same thing happen time after bastard time, and then you feel like kind of an asshole, because the guy who runs the place is a really nice guy and you don't begrudge him his success, but damn was it nice to have a cool little place all to your own for a while, and you just sort of miss that cozy, intimate vibe, you know? I mean. I imagine. Everything. People. Ruin. Everything. Think of a nice park. Maybe there's 10 people in it. It's quiet. People are strolling. Or sitting. Very nice. Now that same park and it's a holiday. All the benches are taken with families. Or a birthday party. People are playing loud music. There's nowhere to sit. Not relaxing. Not peaceful. Trash everywhere. I honestly can't think of one thing where it got popular and better. There is a point where too many people like it, or want to do it, and it goes to shit. Edit. Some people seem to think I want no one anywhere. That's not my point at all. Just that any situation I can think of, there is a point where too many people makes the experience worse. I will concede that, if you dig deep into virtual spaces like bid torrents and crowdsourcing, that is not the case. But anything that requires physical space, there is a point where too many people for that space slash gathering is awful. Including overcrowded stadiums, overcrowded theme parks, and most during launch periods. I'm not advocating that people can't enjoy things, and that more than a few people is bad. The San Francisco scene in the mid to late 60s. Hippers had rented houses up and down Haight and Ashbury. They had free crash houses, houses set up as free mess halls, free clinics. The Grateful Dead and Jefferson Airplane held free concerts in the park every weekend. They were building their own little paradise, and, at least at the time, it was working. When the media coined the term turn on, tune in and drop out edit, Lee recoined the phrase. The media publicized it much further. Thanks for all the corrections, 100s of teenagers a day started showing up. They overwhelmed the budding infrastructure. Teens were turning to hard drugs and prostitution to cope and survive. Kids were getting exploited everywhere. The people who were there in the beginning don't remember the summer of love as fondly as history does. It was the beginning of the end. The dead talked about the moment they knew everything changed. They were walking to the park on their way to hold another concert and people started to follow them to the park. By the time they got there, there was thousands of people following them down the street. The evening news let their magic escape and no one could put it back in the bottle. After the hate Ashbury scene was destroyed, and Nixon was elected, there was a huge feeling of defeat. That is when hippies started retreating to communes. When a band slash rapper is up and coming, and unsure of themselves, but super passionate and still a little broke, they put their all into their music and oftentimes fucking rule. 
as soon as people start loving it and telling them they are geniuses it goes to their head and they often start putting in less effort and or trying to keep that genius level while not realizing what made them so special in the first place. While it's a little hipsterish to say well I like their early work but anything post X era is garbage there's some truth to it. Good example, con. Tiny homes. When they first came out, there were only a couple of companies building them, and they were very inexpensive. They then became popular and trendy, and they turned into luxury items. The one type of house that a normal person could afford ended up being unreachable due to rich people requesting them with every amenity. The companies all jumped on the bandwagon, as more money is always better than less money, and they left the poorer people to continue renting and struggling on the verge of homelessness. Edit, this got bigger than I thought, so I'll throw this out there. To builders of tiny houses, consider marketing to us average folk. We want to buy, but we can't afford the luxury tiny houses. To city staff, consider updating zoning bylaws to allow tiny homes. Boost the economy by getting the average person into home ownership, and get people off the streets who'd rather not be there. To charities slash philanthropic developers, please consider working with local governments to get zoning updated and set up tiny house communities with a rent to own program to help everyone get into home ownership. Set up various ones with varying monthly payments based on income and size. 200 FT2 700 FT2, for example. They can then, if they like, sell it back to you and have a dollar sign 40k dollar sign 100k down payment for a larger slash better tiny house or a full size house slingshot the masses to success i hate this answer when i see it but here it is reddit this isn't my first account when i got my start reddit had a reputation for conversation between people who never meet in real life soccer moms and addicts urban and rural political opposites Upvotes were from relevance and novelty, rather than popularity or wit at least a lot of the time. It was a place for the curious and a place where you could go to be a part of what was happening on the internet. With popularity came the ubiquitous YouTube comments level comment etiquette and upvote rational, which obliterated the usefulness of the upvote. See also, every free to play multiplayer online game with a really bad community. It's the same fucking community, don't talk to me about TF2 vs lol vs Dota 2 vs even Overwatch which costs money, but was popular enough to get big enough to bring in the lowest of the low. Reddit used to expand your experience and let you peer outside your bubble, but now in all the valuable ways it was embiggening, it is now diminutive. The hive mind of meme is all. Broken arms, banana for scale. My secret single bathroom at work. It used to be a toilet for disabled people, and it still is on every other floor in this spot, but no one noticed that the sign got taken off, and it's now a normal toilet. I can't take a shit in a normal stall, while someone next to me farts as loud as a truck followed by a huge splash. I always have to be as silent as if I'd try to hide from a T-Rex while clenching my but until I start sweating. Then I discovered my new haven. A big room, a toilet that wouldn't splash and no one to bother me. I could shit in there for minutes and even lay down and take a nap. It was glorious. Then it happened. People noticed me using the toilet. Now almost everyone uses it. And I can't use it anymore. Because whenever I try to use it it's either occupied or it smells like someone just died in there. I don't know what people eat. When I shit in there I could send my GF right in afterwards and she wouldn't notice. But those people... It's like they ate hot trash fresh from the street. I guess now the stall should be free. But if I try to nap in there, my feet would pop up under the door for everyone to see. John Cena. Back when he was doing his heel rapper gimmick he was getting thunderous reactions from the fans because he was edgy and different. He had a good look and his opponents did a tremendous job of making him look like a better wrestler than he was. But because the fans really liked him, Vince gave them what they wanted, and Cena went from the mid-card to the main event. That's when fans decided he wasn't a good enough wrestler to be headlining events and booed the now good guy John Cena. It then became cool to boo Cena. He's actually a really great guy and sometimes, not all the time but sometimes, wrestling fans can be utter pricks. Facebook. And although it was a big step in the wrong direction, when your grandma could make a profile that wasn't what ruined it. Two things. When Facebook decided to fuck everybody on 
that we'll never charge claim, and stopped showing shit from the pages you follow and began forcing every artist and business to pony up big dollars, just to get their shit seen, and then cut back the ways pages could interact with fans to reinforce this. Now, Facebook has very little value to most business owners. When Facebook got so popular that people were going there to discuss news and zeitgeist topics, it decided to become a news aggregate just in time for the 2016 election cycle, and that made the whole machine collapse. Families were being riven over political fights on Facebook, decades-long friendships ending. I used to be there to keep up with my friends' doings. Now I can't do one scroll without being hit with at least three political articles. Facebook is contributing way too much to stress levels in this country. Twitter's just as bad now. I barely see my friends shit, because everything is politics. You don't meet new people, or stumble into fun conversations anymore on Twitter. When a platform appears that's user friendly and allows truer, more interactive ways for business and consumer to engage directly, it will slowly overtake Facebook, which will respond by transferring more and more into an original programming house. If the new platform can find some way to keep as much news and politics out as possible, it will become bigger than Facebook. People are sick of it and ready to leave, but amazingly no one yet has stepped up with a platform that really has what it takes. Poker, without a doubt. I started playing in the late 80s and the next decade was glorious. No matter what your preferred game was, or how big or small your stake, you could find all kinds of games in most places. Want to play Omaha Hilo in a $1 to $5 spread game? There's probably a game in the back of a pool room in your hometown. Prefer 7 card stud game for $1 and $2? The guys over at the nearest military base have one going all the time. If you're a sadist who likes $10 and $20 jacks or better, you could walk into almost any casino card room and find someone willing to sit the table. And then came along Esp. They decided screwing up coverage of actual sports wasn't enough, and decided to branch out and destroy other pastimes. They start broadcasting the main event at the World Series of Poker. Every douchebag in the country who owned a hoodie and thought wearing sunglasses indoors looked cool suddenly thought they could become a poker player. But only if the game was Texas Hold'em, because that's what the professional douchebags on TV are playing for millions of dollars. Fast forward to today, you walk into almost every poker room in the country and the only options are Hold'em. Ask for another game and the room manager will look at you like you just asked if you could diddle a kid on center table. If you're lucky, they'll say, we might have a game on Saturday night, if enough people are interested. But don't worry about showing up Saturday night. You'll sit around for an hour or five waiting for a semi-full table. It won't be a total loss. Even though the game never gets off the ground, you will be able to watch a steady stream of idiots who are sure they can replicate what they see on TV. If you're lucky, you'll see them sit in a pot or no limit game. Usually, they aren't there for more than an hour. The girlfriend will be standing on the rail, and will be imploring him to leave after an hour of massive losses. He'll get angry and blame the loss on her, because she's distracting him from practicing maximum douchebaggery, my bluff didn't work because of you. Close bracket. Finally, you'll get to see him storm off, roughly grabbing her arm on the way out, so he can take her to the parking lot, and give her the beating she deserves. His vacated seat will be taken by one of the 200 idiots on the waiting list.